Good morning, church. Happy New Year. You have made it six whole days. Woo! Yeah. That's, for some of us, that's a big deal. And that's okay. You're here to celebrate that. I'm going to put a picture up. And if you know who it is, shout out the name of this guy as soon as you recognize who that is. Oh, who knew that? Okay. All right. Now, I've never watched the show. I don't know much about it, but I do know this much. Apparently, Homer Simpson frequently has episodes of talking to God. And some have called it the most overtly religious show on TV. And I, I don't know about that. So Homer looks at him and he says, I can't believe it. This is the creator of the universe, the Lord of all, right? And he's looking at him. He says, God, tell me, what is my purpose? Why am I here? And his eyes get wide with anticipation. Can you just see it? And God leans forward and opens his mouth. And just as he's beginning to speak, the credits roll. <laughs> and we never get to hear the answer. Maybe Homer did. I don't know. You can find him. Ask him. I am so glad you're here today because God did leave us a way of knowing our purpose. He didn't leave us as orphans. He didn't leave us without a road map. He left us a blueprint that if you study God's word and you know it, you can find what your purpose is and you can live a life with passion and intensity and peace and joy and yes, absolutely, purpose. We can live that way because we were created for significance. Hear me. Not one person in this room is an accident. Not one person is here by chance, by random, just chance happenstance. Atoms bumping into atoms and pff, you're here. You are created for a purpose. And you are significant in God's eyes. He died for you. He lived. We sung these songs today. It was perfect. And so for the next five weeks, I'm going to walk us through Luke. Luke 14, 15, and 16, essentially. Three chapters that will change your life. I'm going to make a guarantee that I have never done. If you've been with me for 15 years, you know I have never said this. I will guarantee you this. If you can make it and you go through this entire five-week series together with me, you will come away with a better understanding of the heart and purpose of why you are here. Not only individually, pew, 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 but collectively as a church. Why are we here? What is our significance? And you will have a better grasp of God's intention for your life. That's a pretty cool guarantee, and I hope you take it up with me on that. Luke 14, open your Bibles there. I want to share a couple things. Let me set the stage in the context. If you're going to follow along on your digital app, I'm going to read from the CSB for the most part. And if you're watching home alone with us, great to have you pull up your CSB translation. What I want to do is set the stage here. Pastor House Seed, he's the pastor of a New Song Community Church way out in La La Land. We call it California. And he's over there. And he's the one many, many years ago that first came up with this campaign, this idea of being created for significance. And his whole campaign launched years ago because he sat down and God spoke to him through the exact chapter we're looking at today, Luke 14. It is so, so powerful. We're going to look at a lot of scripture. So I hope you have your Bibles. If not, we'll put it up on the screen. Follow along with me today, starting verse 14 or verse 1 of chapter 14. One Sabbath, when he went to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, they were watching him closely. Don't you love that? There in front of him was a man whose body was swollen with fluid. In response, Jesus asked the law experts and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they kept silent. So Jesus took the man and he healed him and he sent him away. I love that. And then he looked at him and he said, which of you whose son or ox falls into a well will not immediately pull him out even on the Sabbath day? They could find no answer to these things. Jesus stumped them. Don't you love that? These Pharisees, Jesus comes along and he's like, oh, I, I, I know what you, picture this. Get this mental picture. Jesus shows up and there's all these guys lined up there. They probably got their arms folded and they're looking down at this poor guy who's in need. And Jesus looks at the poor guy who's hurting. He looks at the people around him doing nothing. He's like, oh, I get it. Oh, I get it. This is a test. You brought me here to see what I'm going to do. Jesus, I bet he was a little annoyed. Can you imagine this? He's probably disappointed in this group of religious leaders here because Jesus sees right through them. He sees this guy. He's suffering. He's hurting. He's down and out. And he knows full well those guys all around don't care one whit about him. All they want to do is set Jesus up. They're using this poor guy as an object lesson to be used just to get at Jesus. And that's sick. 
We would never do anything like, hold on. Jesus says, guys, I know what you're thinking. You think it's unlawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he calls him out. He says, but you do good on the Sabbath if it suits your purpose, don't you? And he calls him out. I love this. He says, come on, if your son fell in a well, I promise you, you don't go down and look in the well and go, sorry, son. I hope you could tread water an awfully long time because it's a Sabbath day and you got about 18 more hours. Maybe I'll find some of those little puffy floaty things and I'll drop them down the well and you can, you can just kind of tread water. But it's a Sabbath and you know, if God doesn't want us to work on the Sabbath. And he calls him out and he says, don't tell me you wouldn't rescue your son because you would. You would do good at this. And, and that's when Jesus just pulls the pin on the truth grenade and right there, right in front of everybody, he just says, I'm going to leave this right here. And he just blows them away. And he says something that, honestly, they all should have known. And I think that annoys them even more because it annoys me. And I get kind of agitated. And basically, Jesus says, look, my heavenly father, your God, your supposed the one that you know, is far more interested in loving people than in keeping your legalistic rules. Well, they don't like to hear that. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, man, I'm like, get them, Jesus. <laughs> you tell them. You tell those Pharisees, you, you just spank them one more time, man. You go get them, Jesus. What if, to quote my good friend Lee Corso, God says, not so fast, my friend. Oh, no, no, no. All you college game day people know exactly what this is about. Not so fast, my friend. And that's where it hits us. What if God is saying, I'm not talking about everybody else today. I'm talking about you. He's talking about me. In other words, find yourself in this story. Where are you? Where are you in this story? Now, get the mental picture. Jesus is invited to this party. He strolls bebopping up in the front yard. And there, sitting in the front yard, all the other guests have apparently arrived. It's kind of like that surprise birthday party where you tell all the normal guests to show up at 6, but you don't tell the guest of honor 6. You say 6.30 so that when the guest of honor comes, everybody can jump out and go, surprise, right? Only this time, there was no surprise. This poor, suffering soul is the surprise. And Jesus comes up, and he just, I could just picture them. They're all lined up, kind of in a semicircle around this guy. Their arms are folded in front. And in the dead center of them is this poor guy who's out of place. He's probably not part of their social class. Probably doesn't have their money. He's dressed differently, I'm sure, because of the ailment he has. He has edema. Your translation may even say dropsy. It is a horrible condition. And Jesus comes up and looks at him, and on closer inspection, he sees his legs are swollen, his arms are swollen, his face is swollen, his feet are swollen. He is swollen and absorbing excess fluids all over, probably because of kidney damage. We know that now today, but they didn't. All they knew was this guy was a freak and grotesque to look at. He was in obvious pain. And if they didn't do something to heal this guy soon, he had weeks, maybe months to live. That's how serious this is. And none of them were doing anything to help him. That is, except Jesus. Picture that. And Jesus is probably there just looking at this whole scene, just thinking, what are you doing? So let me ask, who are you at this party? We see three classes of people. Which one are you? If you had to find yourself, if God says, find yourself in this, I mean, hopefully, instantly, all of us can eliminate that we're not Jesus. <laughs> I'm not perfect. You, if, if you feel you are, come talk to me after church, but hopefully we can all knock, just cross that off the list. It's not Jesus who God is trying to say we are like in this photo. Chee -chee. Right? Everybody got it? So we move to the second class of people. We see, okay, well, there's the sick guy. And I'm thinking, all right, well, maybe I'm him. And then I look closer and I say, you know, that can't be me because I'm not that sick. I mean, that, most of us here today are in reasonable good health. The fact that you are here today is a testimony of God's faithfulness. Most of us are in some kind of shape, a <laughs> decent shape. We're all far better looking, far more humble than this poor guy right here. So we think, well, I'm not the sick guy, so I can't be him. Well, since there's only three kinds of people in this story, we got a problem. That means now I got to take a look at that semicircle of staunchly robed guys with their arms folded saying, what are you going to do, Jesus? You going to heal this guy? I don't want to be that guy. I don't want to be the Pharisee. But as I look at this, I'm thinking, well, they were highly educated. Check. They had high responsibilities in the church. <laughs> Check. They knew all the rules. They knew all the regulations. They knew everything by heart. They knew the Old Testament. They tried their best to live their lives by those laws. And frankly, they didn't really care much for you if you didn't. 
And I look at this picture and I say, what if God's spirit is saying to us, this is you. You are closer to the Pharisees than you are to the poor man who needs healing. You are closer to the Pharisees than you are my son. You know, and I, what if we have to admit he's right? I mean, after all, I look at this, I think, here I am. I'm a religious leader. I've studied the book. I know the rules. I've tried my best to abide by them. I even know the rules that aren't in this book. Things like don't drink, dance, smoke, or chew. Don't run out with girls who do. <laughs> I know all these. So what do we do? If, are we closer to the Pharisees? Well, let's read on. Look at verse 7 with me. We're going to switch to the MSG translation right now. He says, he went on to tell a story to the guests around the table, noticing how each one had tried to elbow into the place of honor. He said, when someone invites you to dinner, don't take the place of honor. Somebody more important than you might have been invited by the host. Then he'll come and call out in front of everybody, <clears throat> excuse me, sir, you are in the wrong place. The place of honor belongs to this guy, red-faced You'll have to make your way to the very last table, the only place left. When you're invited to dinner, go sit at the last place. Then when the host comes, he may very well say, friend, come up to the front. <laughs> That'll give the guests something to talk about. What I'm saying is this. If you walk around with your nose in the air, you're going to end up flat on your face. But if you are content to be simply yourself, you will become more than yourself. Now, if you've ever been to a party or a social event, if you've even just survived middle school, you know exactly what's going on here. You know about social strata and classifications in the cool table. You know all about it. I mean, we see it in the military. We got ranks. You know who the general is. You know who the private is. You see it in companies. You know who the CEO is and who the vice president is and who cleans the toilets. You even see it in the animal kingdom. You see it in the hen houses all the time where every chicken knows exactly who the head rooster is. <laughs> you know it. And this, this is how some of you came through 2018, by the way. Congratulations. <laughs> You're in the right place. You made it. It's called a pecking order, even in the animal kingdom. And we do this. Now, remember, in Jesus' day, this, this was even more blatant. It was even more crazy. The more important you were, the closer you got to sit to the host. But see, maybe Jesus is still worked up from that charade he just witnessed out in the front lawn with all the guys with their arms folded. And maybe he just wants to say, you know what, while I'm giving lessons here on doing good, I'm going to teach them how to act at a party too. So he says, don't seek the best seats. Seek the place of humility. You want purpose in your life? You want passion? Start treating others the way Jesus did. And watch how your world changes. Don't seek the best seats. Let God exalt you when it's appropriate. Man, you don't hear that very much. That's not a message that's popular anymore. Our culture teaches just the opposite. And that's what I love about Jesus. He shows up and things get all hibbity-flibbity and he turns things upside down. He comes and says, no, 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 nobody puts baby in a corner. You don't do that to people. I love that about Jesus. So maybe Jesus is, is just coming along. He, I love how he confounds their fake wisdom here in this world. And he's thinking to himself, well, I'm on a roll. I might as well tell him not just where to sit at a party, but I'm going to teach him how to throw a party. Look what he says next, starting in verse 12. So he turns to the host and he says, next time you put on a dinner, don't just invite your friends, your family, and your rich neighbors, the kind of people who can return the favor. Invite some people who never get invited at all. Oh, this is speaking, church. Listen to this. Invite the misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. I love that. You will be and you will experience a blessing. They won't be able to return the favor. Yes, that's the point. But the favor will be returned. Oh, how it will be returned at the resurrection of God's people. He's already referring to your rewards that you're storing up by your holy and righteous living. So Jesus shows, shows up and he says, don't throw a party and just invite all the nice, shiny people. Okay? All those people who are already in your circle. Instead, use this opportunity to invite the not-so-cleaned-up people, those who don't know how to throw parties. And if you do that, God is looking to bless you. He is proud of that. That's the kind of party he throws. So here's where it gets real. I'm studying this this week. I'm doing my research. I'm putting together. I'm pouring over notes. I'm looking at what Pastor House Seed talked about years ago. And I started thinking about the people who attend the party we throw here every weekend at our church at 1030 a.m. You know who attends that party? Nice, safe, shiny, cleaned up, great people who are probably already convinced and are Christians. In fact, most of the visitors we know show up are nice, safe, shiny, cleaned up, already convinced Christians. And then I started wondering, 
Do we have any seekers who were invited to this party? Or is it just us? Is it just the family? And I thought, Lord, I don't want to be a Pharisee. I don't want to be that guy whose purpose is out of alignment with yours. And I certainly don't want to be the guy who has a clue who the party's for. So when Pastor Howe read this part of Luke 14, he was stunned. I have a quote of what he wrote. He said this. He says, I didn't know what to do. So I stopped. I just prayed a simple two-sentence prayer. Want to hear it? This is so cool. He says, God, I am sorry for living this way. I don't know what to do, but I know this. I want you to change me. Church, that is a powerful prayer that can push you over the edge to living a life of significance. That can jumpstart your 2019 and reclaim your passion. When you start praying bold prayers like that, when we launched this church, we wanted to be different. We didn't want to be part of that church that was looking at status and pride over humility. We didn't care about the Beamer W's in the parking lot and the stained glass and the steeple, how loud the pipe organ could go. What about that? There was enough people finding that church. What about those who didn't have that? We were so excited. You know what? We're actually going to sing songs that aren't written only 300 years ago by dead Germans. We're actually going to sing songs written in this decade. We'll still sing some of the old great songs if the theology is sound, but we'll actually do things that relate to the culture so that when guests and invitees who don't know Jesus show up, they don't feel like they've gone in a time warp back to Bach. And then we said, you know what? We're also not going to do sermonettes that a reader's digest, light and fluffy, and send you on the way with a pat on the head and say, go get them, tiger. You're good and perfect. Because I know me, and I'm not very good. Just ask my wife. I am far from perfect. Feel free to disagree. Okay, all right, no, just let it there. We said, you know what? We're not going to do that. We're going to inject passion and humor and art and drama and things from everyday life that people can relate to. And when non-believers show up or new believers and they don't have a clue where itch it, which end of the Bible to look at, we'll take that pride away and we'll put the words on the screen and we'll show scripture verses and say, it's okay. Wherever you are on your journey, you are invited to this party. Trust me, when they come and they meet the Lord, he will do the transforming. He will do the judging, and he will do the convicting, just like he does to us. And that's why we do things a little differently. So let's recap, before we go on, five things we've already learned from Luke 14. If you got your pen, you want to write this down. Number one, God's word is powerful. Who is it? He speaks to me through it. He changes me. He chastises me. He encourages me. If I'm willing to listen, if I'm willing to consider the truth about myself, it will change me for the better. How you doing spending time in God's word? Number two, prayer is powerful. A little prayer, just like how seeds, a little two-sentence prayer can change your heart. It can come and restore passion and purpose for living and give you a fresh sense of God's closeness. Number three, the dangerous one, it is real easy to become a Pharisee. Mm -mm -mm. It's real easy to know the book so well that you get to the point where you start living as if the rules matter more than the people. That's a dangerous place, which leads to number four. It's where things get a little fuzzy on the purpose of life. And in number five, God always wants outsiders invited to his party too. Always, always, always we need to leave room for one more at our table. Amen? That's what it's about. This is so obvious that this is God's heart right here in this passage. As we head into 2019 and we finish 15 years, we're wrapping up next month of existence. And God willing, we launch into another 15 years together. I hope you will embrace these lessons with me. Will you? Will you let God's word in your life? In 2019, you want it better than, than last year? Will you set aside time each day to read it? Start with five minutes. Elbow that time out like you would tip off for a really important basketball game. Sorry, too close to home? Okay, I'll move on. What about prayer? Are you willing to pray? Are you willing to spend five minutes with them? Maybe with your children, showing them the example? Maybe you want to pray that short little two-sentence prayer. God, I don't know what I want to do here, but I know I want to be different. Will you change me and make me more like Jesus? Wow, it's a powerful prayer. Will you resist the pull of becoming a Pharisee this year and avoid putting rules and legalism ahead of loving people? And probably the one that's most important is, will you be willing to invite outsiders to the party here on the weekends? So it's not just a holy huddle. God bless us for no more. Close the door. We're good. 
It's so easy to do that. We always want to leave room for one more at the table. Now let's look at what Jesus does next. This party is not over. Oh, I wish I was at this dinner party. Look at verse 16. Then he told him, a man was giving a large banquet and invited many. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who were invited, come, because everything's now ready. But without exception, they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, can't come, just bought a field. I got to go out and see it. I ask you to excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to go try them out. I ask you to excuse me. And another said, just got married, <laughs> therefore honeymoon awaits. I am unable to come. Verse 21, so the servant came back and reported these things to his master. Then in anger, the master of the house told his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the city and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the blind, the lame. Master, I've done everything you've said. Everything you've ordered has been done and there's still room. So the master does something unprecedented. He says, then go out into the highways, into the hedges and make them come in so that my house may be filled. And I love it. It's like a PS. For I tell you, not one of those people who were invited will enjoy my banquet. Because they said no. Or worse, they said yes, and then backed out. Y'all, this is where it gets so powerful. If you know just two things about early century banquets, they were only put on by big deal, VIPs. And you threw big parties. It was awesome. The common people, like me and you, you might have a buddy over to watch Alabama beat Clemson tomorrow night, roll tide. You might do something like that. But you wouldn't throw a big party. You, did, you couldn't afford it. You would have these, these VIP gatherings. By the way, if you RSVP'd, it was huge. It was very important. You had to RSVP and say, I'm coming, because guess what? They couldn't decide what kind of meat they were going to have at the party until they had the head count. Did you know that? They, that, that was dictated because of how time-consuming it was to go find the beast, butcher it, cook it up, roast it, and get it ready for the feast. It was a big deal. You better have some experience cooking if you were going to throw a big shindig. And if you didn't have experience, then you better bring in an expert or somebody who knows what's going on, like a Guy Fieri or a Gordon Ramsay. Because if you didn't, man, it was on. Remember, here's the key. There was no refrigeration back then. So when guests were invited, they counted, they slaughtered something for you. And if you didn't come, it went to waste. They could only prepare the meal that was actually used that day. Here's the actual formula coming, truthfully, from Chef Gordon Ramsay back in ancient Babylon based on the number of guests. If you were expecting two to four people, you would likely serve a small bird, something like chicken. You know why? Because it was cheap. It was easy to find, and nothing went to waste. They didn't have a problem with that. Got a little bit bigger party, maybe five to eight, you increase the side of the bird. Maybe you go with like a duck or some kind of Bethlehem goose, and you cook that up. There's nothing that went to waste. They consumed it. There was no refrigeration. You start to have a bigger party, 10 to 15, guess what? You're serving goat. 15 to 35, they would slaughter a lamb, probably a fattened lamb. But if you had a huge party, I guarantee you there's no other way to go around it, and this showed you were wealthy, you were well off. 35 to 75 people, you serve beef. It's what's for dinner. This is a big deal. I think about that. I am so glad I didn't live back then. Because if I went to a party and only 15 people were RSVP'd, you'd have to eat goat. Who does that? That's just weird. <laughs> Can you see how important the invitation was? If you RSVP'd, you were coming. You had to be there. You had given your word. Don't miss this church. I'm coming somewhere really serious with this. The invitation would go out several days in advance and say, you coming? Got you down. They would go out and slaughter the animal, cook it up, and have it ready. Everybody at this table knew this was a second invitation. This was very common. They would send a servant to your house and say, listen, dinner's almost ready. It's time to come. Come on. Everybody sitting at that table listening to Jesus knew this was a second invitation. Don't miss this. Every person there knew Jesus was describing something very important when he said, the meal is now ready. Come now. They had given their word. So when Jesus describes people suddenly backing out on this invitation, this is huge. This is a slap in the face. You didn't do this. The first guy says, just bought a field, got to go see it. Please excuse me. Y'all, this is a lie. One of the things I learned researching that this week, nobody bought a field without looking at it back then. Land was so precious. 
They considered it almost sacred. Everybody who bought a land knew where the springs were. They knew where the wells were. They knew where previous walls were. They knew where the boundaries were. They knew who owned it generations prior, how much money it could bring in. They knew how much rainfall it could have. Man, they exhausted it because land was precious and hard to come by. You didn't just say, ah, I think I bought some land. I'm not sure. I might go check it out. Man, they looked at land like we look at pets. They even gave them proper names. No kidding. They treat them that way. So when this guy says, ah, I don't think I'm going to be there. Man, that is an insult of the highest order. He's saying, I can't come because I have some dirt that's more important than your party. And everybody there knew it. So he goes to the second one. The second servant says, I just bought five yoke of oxen. Can't come. I got to go try them out. Please excuse me. Again, a blatant lie. Now, we don't ever do this when God asks us to commit to something. I'll just go on. This is a blatant lie. Ox? Are you kidding me? No one buys an ox without looking. Now, listen, if you're not a big farmer, you know, like me, then you may not understand. A yoke of oxen is two, and it's two in tandem going with the yoke on them, and if they don't pull together, they're worthless. So you test drive them. At the marketplace, there's a strip of field. You literally hook them up and say, mm, no, he goes right. Nope. He goes, I'm out. And you don't buy them. Nobody buys oxen without looking at them. Oxen are these huge beasts of burden that are regal. And By the way, they're not always like that. Did you know that they go through that awkward teenage rebellious time too? Do you know that? Where like the guy grows his hair all out, hanging in front of his face and droopy drawers and disrespect, acts like he doesn't like the parents. Did you know that? We actually have a rare photo of that. I think it's one of those things where it shows that attitude. It's just one of those things that so parents, just take heart. Even in the animal kingdom, that attitude shows up. No one buys an ox without checking it. This is a lie. This is, this is even worse than, than the previous guy because oxen are unclean animals. Land was at least considered important. So this guy is slapping Jesus in the face saying, I can't. So he goes to the third guy. The third excuse is my best. He says, just got married. I <laughs> can't come. Deal with it. You know what's even worse? He doesn't even pretend to be gracious. This is the only re reason and excuse that doesn't even offer an apology. It's the only one. He just says, deal with it. I ain't coming. You know why this is a lie? Because marriages back then were announced a year in advance or more. And no one in their right mind would say, let's throw a party on the night of so-and-so's marriage. Because the whole village was at the wedding. Everybody went there. If you threw a party on the same night as a wedding, it would be absolutely a party of one. You would be the only one sitting there. Paging Mr. Lonely, party of one. So we knew it was a lie, and everybody knew that. So the Lord of the banner says, go out and bring in the other people, because I have a feast prepared, and my heart is to feed people. Buckle up. Buckle up. What Jesus is describing here is blowing their minds. They're sitting around the table like, well, what are you saying? And Jesus says, I want you to go out into the fields, and I want you to go get the, the unlovely. I want you to invite the people who don't look like you, the people who don't make the money you make. And they're like, well, <laughs> we're Pharisees. We can't do that. We'll be contaminated. And he says, I want you to go out and invite the riffraff of Israel. What, is it, there's still room at the table? Then I want you to go outside and invite those who you've never even met on the other side of the river. I want you to go out and bring in those people, those wicked Gentiles. You want to, I want you to invite the deplorables. You go get them, and I want you to bring them here, people outside. And those people sitting at the table are going, yuck. What kind of a God invites trash to a feast like this? And that's the point. What kind of God do we serve that we would keep this to ourselves? And this brings us to the final lesson of Luke 14. God's desire is to fill heaven. And guess what? People from all walks of life are invited, and that's the beauty of it. Every one of us. Now, again, hear me. Whether or not they accept his invitation, that's up to them. Our job is to do the inviting. God's word in 2 Peter is very clear. He says he's being patient right now, holding back, not wanting any to perish, but all should come to repentance. When he takes our sin and puts it on Jesus the blameless Lamb of God, who did no wrong, the perfect one, taking our punishment. That's what he's talking about. This is not some kind of, it's automatic, everybody, some false doctrine of universalism. No. Hear me. I want to be very clear, truth and grace in this message. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father but by him. That's what he said. We, we don't make the rules. That, that's the rule. That's it right there. But the good news is that's for everybody. That is totally inclusive. If you accept his invitation, if you RSVP, and maybe you're here and you're hearing this word and you think, you know what? I've accepted that and I'm ready to take that next step because God, I think he wants more for me. I think he wants me to reclaim that passion and get committed to him, to his kingdom, to putting him first, to knowing him, to diving into his word, to being around other people who support me, who bring me up. Man, when you do that, when you surrender your plans to his plans, you will feel and sense God's peace. You will sense like a smile of God on you like you have never felt. But that's on you, and that's on me to elbow out that time and say, this year is different. I am committing to God. I am going to be with his people. I'm going to be on his days. When the doors are open, I'm going to surround myself with people who believe what I believe to help cheer me up and bring me up. We pray that prayer, God, I'm sorry for living like a Pharisee. I don't know exactly what to do, but I know this. I want you to change me. And if you don't even know where that's going, that's okay. God will meet you where you are, and he will, he will honor you if you seek him and you are living and trying to know him so you don't waste your days on lesser things on distractions. It's things that just dazzle us, little shiny things that keep us from pursuing God's best for our life. When you wake up every morning seeking to align your day with him, truly seeking before your feet hit the ground to align your day with his purpose, you will find that you have been never more free when you are trying to honestly do God's will instead of my will. It is a powerful thing. So here's what I'm pledging to you. With what I have left of the rest of my life, I want to live it in pursuit of God's will. And I want to invite you and you and you and you and you to take that journey with me. Here at the Potter's Hand, over the last 15 years, lives have been changed. Missionaries have been sent. People have been baptized. Marriages have been healed. Finances have been absolutely turned back around. Children have been helped. People have been fed. An eternity with Christ has been changed. An eternity has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life for hundreds of people. And it started with just a few regular Joes who prayed a bold prayer. God, do something different. I don't know what you want to do exactly, and that's okay. I just know this. I want you to change me. Will you do something fresh in my life, God? Can you imagine what your 2019 would look like if you were that serious? If you were that committed, mom and dad, to passionately pursuing Jesus and demonstrating that for your children? Can you imagine what your 2019 would look like, wife, husband, if you passionately loved each other and served each other and put the other person's needs first like Jesus did? Can you imagine the impact that would have as a follower of Christ on your church? on the kingdom around here, those unlovelies who never get invited to the party. Can you imagine how that would change? Because friends, you were created for significance. And according to Jesus, that significance is tied to the very plan of God, the very heart of God. So here's the deal. I want to challenge every one of us to all play our part. To not be content with the status quo, even if 2018 was a banner year for you. Woo, that's awesome. Take it to the next level. Take it to the next step. Can we do that? Can we play our part in the kingdom boldly and sincerely and passionately where we are committed to advancing his kingdom? We are committed to being in the word. We are committed to prayer. Not like the Pharisees, not for the purpose of winning the best seats or getting an applause or an attaboy, but for the reason of honoring God, reclaiming that passion and showing a lost and dying world, there's something different. I don't get it all, but I know this. There's great food here. I can't get enough. Would you come on? I'm one beggar telling another where I found great food, and it's free. It's not that it didn't cost anything. It's just already been paid for. The table's set. The banquet's here. What will you do with it? Let me pray for us. God, I thank you for this incredible series of parables that just have so much profound truth. I thank you for convicting me, convicting our hearts. Lord, we don't necessarily know the future. We know the last 15 years have been awesome. But Lord, we pray that you would change us and make us more like Jesus and that the next 15 would be even better. Whether that's something we have never even thought of, whether that's something fresh and new, or whether that's something that you just light a fire in our hearts, your will be done. Lord, we commit that to you. 
God, we thank you for bringing us in this place, God. We don't want to be content to just go through the motions, to just be on the treadmill, be on the grind. We want to have that passion and that purpose. So, Lord, in this time, we commit ourselves to you, and we ask that you would do what only you can. In Jesus' name, amen.